to give a warm welcome to Professor Robert West, who is a professor in health psychology in not in epidemiology and public health anymore. But Will be uh, from from the first of August. There'll be a new department. Right, a new department in behavioural science and health. Okay. And Robert's going to talk to you about e-cigarettes and their impact on trying to reduce people's problems. Yeah, 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 something like that. <laughs> okay. yes. Well, over to you, Robert. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, uh, population health, it's, it's hard to imagine anything more important, really, uh, clearly, and I'm sure that's part of the reason why you're here, is because population health combines uh, uh, an issue which is of massive importance globally, as well as nationally, as well as regionally, as well as locally, um, and individually, with an approach to science which is applicable across a wide range of areas. And that approach to science is one that recognises uncertainty. That if you, uh, even if you do a hundred studies on something, very high quality studies, on an issue of huge importance, at the end of it, you have a certain level of confidence in the results of those studies and predicting what's going to happen in the future. But you can never be absolutely certain, particularly because when it comes to human behaviour, which is largely what we're dealing with here, it is very context dependent. So to give you an example from the area that I work in before talking about e-cigarettes, a related uh, topic, uh, many of you will have he heard of nicotine patches, nicotine gum, that kind of thing. Yeah. Some of you may have even used them to, uh, to give up smoking. Um, back in the early 1980s, I did one of the first randomized controlled trials to demonstrate that nicotine gum, which was the only one available at that time, was effective in helping people stop smoking. By effective, I mean that it doubled your success rates from pathetically small to very small. Okay. Now that. Sound, you know, to some people that may be uh, a, a quite a negative message, but you replicate that across a whole population and you're looking at saving literally millions of lives a year if people use that intervention rather than trying to stop smoking by themselves. Okay, so we did one of the very, very early studies. Since then, there have been more than 100 high-quality, randomised controlled trials um, with... Uh, objective verification of outcome, biochemical verification, so we're not just relying on what smokers tell us they've done, but objectively testing using biochemical methods whether they have genuinely stopped smoking for at least a year. And those studies confirmed what we found in the very first study, which is that it approximately doubles your success rate. Okay, so you think, well, okay, that's a done deal. We do not need to study this anymore. Turns out not to be true. Uh, a population level study that we did in my group, uh, uh, published a couple of years ago, looked at what happens when you use nicotine replacement therapy, which you just bought from a shop instead of being given it in a randomized controlled trial or prescribed it by your doctor or uh, another health professional. And what we found was no effect. No effect. And that is the, by far the most common way in which people are using nicotine gum, nicotine patches, and so on in our society. They're just going out to a shop and they're buying it. So, on the one hand, we have a confident, uh, a high level of confidence that uh, nicotine replacement therapy improves your chances of stopping smoking. And on the other hand, we have a real-world epidemiological study which has failed to find an effect when people use that method in a particularly common way. What's the difference? What we think is the difference is that when you use it in a way that most people do, which is just to go and buy it from a shop, you do it in a way in which the context is not conducive to that particular medicine working. Because stopping smoking is not like catching a cold or trying to get over a cold or some other uh, physical condition. It's a behavior. 
And as a behavior, it has a, a wide range of contextual factors that influence it. And if you just go and buy nicotine patches or nicotine gum from a shop without imposing the kind of structure, setting a clear quit date, making sure that you take the medication long enough, making sure that you use enough of it, all those things that you get in randomized trials, which provide a structure around the behavior, then the very same medicine is failing to have an effect. This is extremely important in public health terms, given that even now, smoking is killing something in the region of 80,000 people a year in this country alone, and around 6 million a year worldwide. So, what we have here is a, an illustration of the complexity of, the situ of uh, human behavior and, uh, and the issues we're dealing with in population health. But at the same time, I don't want to give you the impression that it's all hopeless, because we, we know nothing, because that's not true either. And in order to be able to study population health effectively, you have to be the kind of person who is able to deal with uncertainty and not think of things in black and white. I've, over the years, many, many years, taught medical students. And I have to say, some of you may be medical students or have been medical students. I have to say, it's a bit of an uphill struggle um, with the kind of people who often go into medicine to help them to think in terms of grey, shades of grey rather than black and white. For, for many people in society, if it's not this, it's that. If, it doesn't, if, if we can't show absolutely conclusively that this works all the time, then that means we know nothing. In population health, it's about probabilities. So the, the thing that you're going to, if you study population health, have to deal with all the time is what is, my le what is an appropriate level of confidence in these propositions around population health. That's true of all epidemiology, it's true of all of anything to do with populations where you're dealing with uncertainty and areas where you don't have all the information that you need and where you've got a changing context. Okay. So that's a key thing I want to get across to you, is the importance of understanding that it's not about black and white, it's not about knowing nothing or knowing everything, it's about getting the right level of confidence and building a picture using data that you accumulate. Right. Now, e-cigarettes. Uh, how many of you have ever tried an e-cigarette? Um, have you ever smoked? Okay. Um, anyone? Uh, you don't. Uh, you know. I won't be telling on you. <laughs> I'll put my hand up. And I put my hand up. I have both smoked and tried an e-cigarette, and continue and intend to continue to try them to see what they're like as the new models come out. Because uh, one of the things that's uh, uh, always in my field that I've done is to experiment on myself, which is a good... Uh, it, <laughs> it seems unfair to ask someone else to try something if you're not prepared to try it yourself. Uh, there's, a, there's a few exceptions to that uh, rule, but uh, uh, e-cigarettes are uh, an interesting phenomenon. So, okay. So, e-cigarettes... Has anyone uh, got no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to e-cigarettes? Okay. Thank you. Uh, so e-cigarettes um, came onto the market in the UK around uh, six or seven years ago, initially, um, as devices. They were, they were invented in China uh, by a guy who uh, has taken on board a very important and simple message when it comes to smoking. Which, and the message is that it's the, the tar that kills you but it's the nicotine that keeps you smoking. The nicotine is not the dangerous element within cigarettes. Therefore, if you can provide people with nicotine, the drug that they're seeking, without also providing the tar, which is, the tar is a name given to literally thousands of chemicals in the, in the particles that you inhale when you inhale smoke. If you can give people nicotine in a cleaner form, then in theory, people ought to be willing to transfer from the extremely dangerous form of nicotine intake, which is cigarettes, to a much less harmful form of nicotine, which is, in this case, the e-cigarette. And the way that it works with e-cigarettes is that you have a liquid which contains either propylene glycol or glycerol, 
and some flavorings, and usually nicotine as well, although not everyone uses nicotine in their e-cigarettes. That liquid is then in a cartridge or in a tank, and the, the, most of the e-cigarettes that you see is, is actually the battery. Most of what the bulk of it is actually the battery. And what the battery does is it is used when you um, puff on it or press a button, it's either breath activated or button activated, it heats up an element, a heating element, so that as you draw the liquid over the heating element, it vaporizes, and so in a sense, you're, you're breathing in a vapor which contains nicotine. So what, it, what you're breathing in is nicotine, propylene glycol or glycerol, which, has, uh, which is, uh, to give you an idea about what that is, it's, it's essentially stage smoke. If you ever go to rock concerts, I'm sure you do, uh, or even uh, some plays, you, and, and they need to do smoke, that's what they're using. And this has been quite widely tested. It's not uh, known to be particularly harmful, uh, otherwise you wouldn't be allowed to use it in rock concerts. Um, so uh, you have the nicotine, which is delivered with the propylene glycol, the propylene glycol or glycerol is really important because if you just inhale a nicotine vapor, what happens is the nicotine molecules coalesce in the vapor and they're only absorbed in the lining of the mouth. And what you want is the nicotine to get into the lungs so that you can take advantage, like cigarettes do, of the very large surface area so that you can get a nicotine hit, which is what smokers are seeking. So you have the vapor, uh, inhaled into the lungs, ideally, if it's a, if it's a well-constructed e-cigarette, and that gives you the nicotine that you want. And as many of you will know, if you stood next to someone who's been vaping, very often they use flavorings, and very often those flavorings are very sweet and a bit sickly, but they're all, there are a very wide range of uh, uh, adapted food flavors in, that are now being used in these e-cigarettes. And this has become incredibly controversial. More so in the States, I would say, than in this country, where there's, a, there's more of a puritanical ethic in the United States. But a lot of my colleagues who work in the field of public health believe that e-cigarettes are the devil incarnate. These are de dangerous things that we must try and stop at all costs. And it's a very interesting example of how one's passion for uh, the subject area that you work in can interfere with your judgment around the science. So what you will see and continue to see uh, if, if on, in the newspapers, in the media, and so on, are all sorts of scare stories and horror stories about e-cigarettes. And it is the case that the majority of the UK population, we, we study this every month in our large-scale surveys, the majority of the UK population believes that e-cigarettes are at least as harmful as cigarettes. This is complete nonsense. This is without, I mean, if there's anything that's certain, uh, it is that. Uh, we don't know exactly how much less harmful they are, but they are much, much less harmful. Public Health England has uh, made a, a rough estimate based on the concentrations of the various chemicals in the, in the vapor compared to cigarette smoke and said it, it's, some, it's going to be somewhere in the region of 5% you know, of the harm. That's still not harmless, but it's not the same as cigarettes. So, so that then raises a question, uh, as a pu if, if you're interested in public health or population health, about what you advise people to do. Because for the sake of people's health, then the best thing to do is to stop smoking and not use any form of nicotine or any, anything that you're inhaling into your lungs apart from fresh air. That's the best thing. And yet we've still got 8 million smokers in Britain. And, uh, and that's going to continue for a while. Smoking rates are coming down um, reasonably quickly, but for my lifetime, there'll still be literally millions of smokers in, in this country. If we could encourage, help, support those smokers who could never have quit without an e-cigarette to switch to an e-cigarette, then we could save a huge number of lives. So why do my, why do my colleagues think that they're the devil incarnate? Um, the answer is I don't know, but these are my hypotheses. One of, my, one of the hypotheses is that when you are passionate about a field, as I say, you let your emotions get in the way of your objective judgment. And like all of us, public health scientists very often look for confirmatory evidence of things rather than disconfirming evidence. It's a very common heuristic 
It's a bias in the way we process information. You formulate a hypothesis about someone that they're, 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 they're not a very nice person, and from that moment on, you're looking for uh, confirmatory evidence that they're really not a nice person. And if something goes the other way, then you're saying, well, that's an exception. It's not, you, it's not, it's not a, 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 it's, well, it's a flaw if we've got it, but we all of us have to varying degree. So if you're passionate about the tobacco industry, about what the harm is that they're doing, and you're naturally then very skeptical about anything which seems like it would allow people to continue to use a nicotine product, which may be harmful, then that's going to lead you to that, through that confirmation bias, to taking the view that when evidence comes out, evidence supports, supporting that is true, and evidence conflicting with that is false. And that's the problem. And if you study epidemiology or population science, you've got to guard against that. We must all be highly reflective about our own views, our own hypotheses, and whatever we may feel, we have to um, look at the evidence and try, or try to look at the evidence in as dispassionate a way as possible. Um, now, one of the things that my colleagues who are against e-cigarettes will say is, okay, I accept now that e-cigarettes, most of them will now accept that e-cigarettes are less harmful than smoke. But, they say, they act as a gateway into smoking for young people. In fact, there was a paper published a couple of weeks ago uh, that hits the headlines, because they always do, because they're sensationalists, saying that e-cigarettes cause young people to take up smoking. This is a very uh, interesting argument, uh, which is completely belied by the evidence. Um, if it were the case that the advent of e-cigarettes and use of e-cigarettes were causing people, more people, to take up smoking than would otherwise be the case, what would you expect to happen to the rate of decline in smoking among young people? It's not a, it's not a difficult question. Yes. It would slow down. The rate of decline would slow down. Um, what do you think has happened to the rate of decline? It's sped up. So, um, so in order to sustain the argument that e-cigarettes are a gateway into smoking, you would have to believe that it would have sped up even more, right, um, than it has done, which would be okay if you could think of a particular reason as to why that might have been the case, uh, because it's not impossible. I can't rule it out. We can't rule it out. There is uncertainty there. However, I think it would be very difficult for us to look at, or to, to find something that would sustain that particular view. So while we can't be absolutely sure that e-cigarettes have helped to prevent uh, uptake of smoking among young people, we also, it seems unlikely, thinking about what I said right at the beginning about probabilities, it seems unlikely that they have caused a slowdown beyond what we've had in other ways. So that's one of the arguments. Another uh, area of contention is that e-cigarettes don't actually help people stop smoking, they make it harder. So what my colleagues believe is that if you're a smoker and you use an e-cigarette, it makes it less likely that you're going to stop smoking, not more likely. Okay? And in support of this, they cite evidence, and there's no doubt about the facts, about the, the evidence as it stands, which is that if I take a sample of a thousand people half of whom have tried an e-cigarette at some point in the past, and half of whom have not. And then I look at them a year later. Those who have tried an e-cigarette in the past are less likely to have stopped smoking than those who didn't, right? That's their argument. Can you see a possible flaw in the causal interpretation of that argument? This really goes to the heart of everything we do in population science. It, on the face of it, it looks like bad news for e-cigarettes. Think about people who have headaches and people who take aspirin. If I take a sample of people, a thousand people, half of whom 
regularly take painkillers, and half of whom don't, and I follow them up a year later, and I ask all of them whether they tend to get headaches, and then I find that the people who regularly take painkillers are more likely to get headaches than people who don't. Does that tell us that painkillers are causing headaches? No. What does it suggest? That people who tend to get headaches tend to take painkillers, right? Um, so that in that case, the causation is reversed, right? It's not that taking painkillers causes headaches, it's having a headache causes taking painkillers. In the case of e-cigarettes, what you see is that people who, have, who try e-cigarettes tend to be more dependent smokers. That's why they're trying e-cigarettes, because they think that they may help them to stop smoking. Now, if the e-cigarettes were absolutely brilliant at helping you stop smoking, that, that you know, if you just tried the e-cigarette, then you immediately stopped smoking and never smoked again, fine, you would see a, a reversal of that relationship. But if it was like nicotine gum, or other forms of nicotine replacement, and quite effective, but not hugely effective, then you would see the same relationship that you see with the headaches and the painkillers. Taking a headache does not prevent you getting a painkiller for the rest of your life. It helps with the pain that you've got at the moment, and so you'll take it again. So, if you then look at a population level, which is what we do in my group, at the time series, what's happened to quitting rates is just like the gateway thing, what's happened to quitting rates as the rate of use of e-cigarettes in the population has gone up? It's, it's increased. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, increased, yeah. yeah it's, it's increased substantially. We published a paper in the BMJ uh, last year, I think it was, in which we uh, did a, what's known as a time series analysis in which we looked at the shape of the trend in e-cigarette use, the shape of the trend in quitting rates, and what we found was a statistically significant association between the two after having controlled for other factors statistically, for other factors that may make a difference, like spending on mass media campaigns, like price rises, like introduction of uh, additional smoking cessation, smoking policies and so on. Now again, that doesn't prove it, we, I don't, our data don't prove that the advent of e-cigarettes has improved the rate of quitting. It makes us more. It makes this more likely. It makes, in my judgment, it probable that at a population level, e-cigarette e use has increased the rates of cessation. But we need to keep looking at it and test that hypothesis. And that's what we do. That's essentially the job of anyone working in population science. Is it forming hypotheses, trying to be dispassionate about it, and then testing those hypotheses, and continuing to revise your view on what, the tr what is uh, ultimately going on in the light of that evidence. So that's a little vignette around e-cigarettes, but I think, I hope, it gives you an idea about what we're trying to achieve in population science. We're trying to find things out with a level of probability that's a appropriate to the data that we've got so that policymakers, clinicians and members of the public can use that information in order to be able to, to protect their health. So that's that's the sort of story. Now I rabbited on. Was anything that I said particularly unclear or even slightly unclear? Yes? It's not really, I mean it's more of a question. Yeah. But um, if you know having a cigarette market so um, it wouldn't be true to say that the the e-cigarette e market is unregulated. It's actually quite highly regulated. It's not regulated as a medicine, or at least most of them aren't regulated as a medicine, because that's a whole area, another area of, uh, of um, hoops that you have to go through in terms of proving safety and efficacy. Um, but as you, I'm sure you're aware, it's illegal to sell e-cigarettes to minors, just as it's Ill, uh, anyone under the age of 18, just as it's illegal in this country to sell cigarettes. It's also illegal, by the way, in relation to cigarettes and e-cigarettes, 
to buy uh, one of these products for a minor. So even if, uh, even if you, get, you get someone who's over 18 doing it for someone under 18, that person's committing a crime. It's not illegal in this country to be a minor and smoke, to be a minor and purchase e-cigarettes. The crime is being committed by the supplier, and I think that's appropriate. I don't think you want to be criminalizing young people, otherwise I would have a rather long criminal record by the time I got to 16. So, um, uh, for those sorts of things, not <laughs> Yeah, anyway, <laughs> um, I think the statute of limitations is up. So, um, so it, it is quite highly, it is actually quite a highly regulated market. But, the, but there's a really interesting point you make about the use of e-cigarettes among young people, because you will also see in the press that large numbers of young people are using e-cigarettes. And you may know young people who are using e-cigarettes. The vast majority of those are also smokers. There are also people who smoke. We, we monitor this literally every month, so we know what the, the figures are. The proportion of um, anyone using an e-cigarette who has never smoked is about 0.2%. And it's very similar to the proportion using nicotine patches or nicotine gum or other licensed nicotine products who've never smoked. So what we're seeing in, with young people and e-cigarettes is a, quite a lot of young people try them, but they don't go on to use them. The people who tend to carry on using them are ones who are smoking as well, and they use them either in situations where they can't smoke, or to cut down the amount they smoke, or in an attempt to stop smoking. So I think you're right to highlight it as a concern, but in this country the evidence doesn't te is not telling us that it's an issue for us. And again, but again, it goes to the issue of context, because in the United States, it looks quite different. In the United States, where they have a very different um, uh, hot, a set of uh, laws around, uh, around advertising, you look at the, I mean, we're not, you're not allowed to advertise these cigarettes in this country um, as part of the European Union Tobacco Product Directive. You can have point of sale advertising, but you can't have TV advertising, you won't see uh, large-scale advertising for e-cigarettes. In the United States, uh, oh, and by the way, any advertising that we used to have had to be to smokers as an alternative to smoking. Anything that looked for, you know, even slightly like it was uh, uh, trying to get people to use an e-cigarette you never smoked, not allowed. Um, and there were a few adverts that were taken off the market for that reason. In the United States, if you go and see the e-cigarette advertising there, it's, it's shocking. It's basically large tobacco companies who bought e-cigarette companies who are advertising them like cigarettes and clearly trying to grow the market. And the difference is that in the United States, they have a constitution, what's interpreted as a constitutional right to say what they like in advertising pretty much because it's, a, it's their freedom of expression, which is interpreted by the courts as corporate freedom of speech. And so trying to stop that is very, very difficult in, in the United States. Whereas in this country, we have the Advertising Standards Agency and so on who, uh, who do uh, uh, limit what advertisers can do. So, so country by country, it will be different. So, wait, so if we look at the statistics for like, the US, how many more minors are More minors are smoking in the, in the United States. Uh, sorry, more minors are using e-cigarettes in the United States. Um, but what's interesting is they've also seen um, a a, a, an increase in the rate of decline of smoking. So they're seeing a lot of youth taking up e-cigarettes and a lot of youth not smoking. How that's going to pan out in the future, I don't know, because the, in this country, most of the e-cigarettes that you'll see that people, people buy are relatively small independent manufacturers and developers they're not the tobacco industry. The tobacco industry does produce these cigarettes, and they are on sale in this country, but they're not the dominant uh, force. In the United States, they're mostly the tobacco industry, and what the tobacco industry wants you to do is to smoke cigarettes. If they can get you to use e-cigarettes as well, fabulous, but they mostly want you to smoke. And if you look at the e-cigarettes that are available in the United States, they're really crappy e-cigarettes, mostly. So they don't deliver much nicotine. So you can see, if you were a, 
you know, an unethical corporation, you're, what you've got here is potentially a way of adding to your market. You're getting people to smoke, but you can also get them to use e-cigarettes as well, thinking that, they're, uh, that it's helping them to cut down the amount they smoke, but in fact it isn't. So if I had to guess, I would say that might be a corporate strategy that they would be using. So again, it goes in terms of population health, the context is everything. You know, you, you have a different legal framework, different constitution, different culture, you get different effects. Do you think there's any merit to the whole idea that, like, in the past, uh, smoking was sort of marketed as healthy and, you know, a great thing to do, and then later on they found out that it kills you slowly? Yeah, I, it, it partly... A lot that, like, yeah. right now it's, I don't know, 10 years old or something. Yeah. Like, maybe in 50 years you'll find out that yeah. it kills you. I, 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 absolutely, and I, and I think that's a very natural reaction. And it's not just that the tobacco industry were promoting cigarettes, and doctors were promoting yeah, cigarettes yeah. as a healthy as a healthy option. Which kind of doing? Which kind of doctors are doing for for e-cigarettes? Um, but it's actually also the when the t when the first evidence on the cigarettes as a cause of lung cancer came out, the tobacco industry had a real problem. And what they did was, as you may know, is they introduced filters. And oh, the first filters were made of asbestos, by the way. <laughs> so um, they introduced filters and then what they called light cigarettes. These are the sort of the low tar cigarettes because this kind of, the idea was to reassure smokers that these are, these are less harmful than the high tar cigarettes. And we didn't buy it because in my, in my lab, uh, we already demonstrated in the early 1980s that the amount of tar and nicotine people were getting from these so-called light cigarettes was the same as they were getting from non-light cigarettes. It was a complete fiction based around the way that the government smoking machines smoked the cigarettes. So in a, sm in a government smoking machines, which determines the sort of level of tar of the cigarette, um, what they do is they have a, they, you, you put the thing in, you have a fixed puff duration, fixed number of puffs, over a time period, you measure the tar and all the ingredients that come out of it, and then that tells you how much, whether it's a low tar or a high tar cigarette. And part of the way that they did that was to introduce ventilation holes in the filters so that as the cigarette machine was drawing in the smoke, puffing on the cigarette, air was being drawn in through these ventilation holes, so it's diluting the smoke. But when smokers smoked them, they knew this perfectly well. They cover the ventilation holes with their lips or their fingers. They're designed to be covered because they're in just the position that you cover. So you're not getting the ventilation. But they also puff on the cigarette more deeply. They take more puffs. So essentially end up with the same level of nicotine, tar and so on that they got before. So that was a big con. And the and public health community, quite rightly, is saying, as uh, I think was it Bush famously said, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. And then he forgot the rest of it, <laughs> which made him look a bit like a fool. <laughs> but um, the real saying is, fool me once, shame on you, fool me, uh, fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me three times, seriously, guys, you know, but I, you know, I'm not falling for this one again. So that's, I think, a, a big element of the, of the, the scepticism around these cigarettes. But against that, you have to apply logic and reason and data. And you have, so essentially what you do is you have to what is in the vapour? What is actually in the vapour? What are smokers taking? And we published a paper, again last year, in Annals of Internal Medicine, uh, in which we looked not only what was in the vapour, but what was getting into the body, and what the concentrations were of, the, of um, a wide range of known carcinogens that you get from smoking. And as you would expect from, the, from what we know about the vapour, the concentrations that people were getting in the body were substantially lower, much lower. They weren't zero. So these, these things are not safe. They're just much less harmful than smoke. Yeah. Have I overstayed my welcome? No, no, I've got a question. <laughs> go on then. Go on, keep right, going. There was also, there was, I saw a couple of things about one, like diacetyl or something. Yeah, uh, diacetyl. And then there's also something about sort of how nicotine actually itself cause tumor yeah, um, or heart attack. Heart attack. Okay, 
Well, I can see that you're someone who has um, uh, read the, you know, what, what has been said about e-cigarettes. And a beautiful example of how uh, the, uh, the science has become distorted. And you don't have to, well, you can take my word for it, but don't take my word for it. If you ever get interested in this at all, then, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of literature on this. And the Royal College of Physicians have produced a quite extensive review of the evidence on this. So... Uh, for those of you who don't know, diacetyls are used in some of the flavourings for e-cigarettes. They give you a sort of uh, butterscotch-type flavour. Um, and there is evidence that diacetyls are carcinogenic. So the question then becomes, what concentrations of diacetyls in the e-cigarette vapour, if you choose to use those flavourings, are going to make a a substantial or significant difference to your risk of cancer if you use these things long term. And I think it would be fair to say that if I was an e-cigarettes user, I wouldn't use flavourings that included diacetyls. There's absolutely no need to. There's plenty of other flavourings that you could use. And I think it's absolutely appropriate to let the public know about the risks, even though uh, with the concentrations involved, the risks are relatively low compared with cigarettes. So that's one thing. It doesn't make them as harmful as cigarettes, but this is an avoidable risk, so why take it? The, the story with regard to nicotine and e-cigarettes is a bit more dodgy because um, the, what they have tried to argue, and they, did, did, they never argued this with nicotine gum, which gives you nicotine as well, or nic other nicotine replacement therapy. This was never argued. Um, that, so the argument is that uh, what they have found is that if you use an e-cigarette uh, and you're an abstaining smoker or a non-smoker, it will raise your heart rate and acutely it will raise your blood pressure and it will cause a number of, of reactions in your cardiovascular system. And that's attributable to nicotine. And as someone who has, uh, as I said earlier, in, experimented on myself, uh, as we used to do in the 80s, before the ethics committee thought this was a bad idea, Perhaps they did think it was a bad idea then, even though, I don't know. Anyway, um, we did it. Uh, but we also uh, uh, did it on other people with consent. We would be injecting ourselves with nicotine. So, we, in fact, we would put in a cannula, uh, and, uh, and we, what we would do is to take the typical profile of an e-cigarette smoker, uh, or sorry, of a, uh, of a smoker, and so there would be 10 puffs over a 10-minute period, and we would do pulses of nicotine into the cubicle vein um, to try and simulate that. It's not really simulating because if we were to simulate it properly, we'd have to have the cannula in the carotid artery, uh, but we weren't going to do that. So. Um, but it, anyway, it gives a sort of a, 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 a general sense of what you get if you, if you take nicotine. And it raises your heart rate, it raises your blood pressure, and, uh, and it causes some vasoconstriction. So you're, you're for example, Anyone who smokes has uh, hands and feet that are roughly a degree centigrade, centigrade colder than someone who doesn't smoke. And if they stop smoking, their hands and feet warm up. As an aside, for most people, this isn't an issue. But if you're, uh, if you're in the army, for example, out on maneuvers in cold conditions, it causes what's known as cold injuries, which actually makes, them, makes those soldiers uns unserviceable. Uh, so it's an issue for the army uh, around uh, cold injuries. And, but anyway... The point, the point you raise is, is, so you've got these parameters acutely. The question is, clinically and in population health terms, what's the impact? And as it happens, we have a natural experiment here, which can tell us what the population impact is likely to be. Because in Sweden, they have very high rates of use of a thing called snus, which is an oral tobacco product. It's like a sort of tobacco browns, and you shove it in your mouth between your uh, cheek and your lips, sometimes in a little tea bag to make it a bit more sanitised. And it gives very high concentrations of nicotine. It's very popular in Sweden. So what we have there is people who are getting high concentrations of nicotine, but without the tar and carbon monoxide from smoking cigarettes. And the question is, what do their heart disease profile look like? And the answer is, it looks like non-smokers. So in that large epidemiological uh, situation, we, we don't see an increase in risk of cardiovascular disease among snooze users. That means, I think, you can't say for absolute certain, but if 
nicotine per se causes an increase in cardiovascular risk, it's likely to be much, much smaller than what you see from, from smoking. And we know that most of the heart disease risk from smoking comes from other ingredients of the cigarette smoke, essentially um, uh, oxidizing agents in the cigarette smoke that get into the body and damage the artery. Do you want to do your question then? I'll get yeah, to I was going to briefly just say something about the relationship between big tobacco and e-cigarettes. Yeah, which is big in, in the States and yeah. less big here. And, and I think, so the, one of my colleagues who's very anti-e-cigarette, he's a good mate of mine, and we, we both have very similar political views, uh, uh, which you might be able to guess are not to the right. <laughs> um, I, his concern about e-cigarettes is a broad theoretical one, rather than one based on the evidence that I've been talking about. And it is that, where you have, and this is, this is again going to be a big issue in, in population health, where you have large vested interests, hugely powerful, hugely rich corporations, uh, who are interested in making a profit out of something that does harm, you better watch out. Because those corporations will distort the market, they will distort the picture, they will try and undermine the science. And, and tobacco companies have done that over decades, as the alcohol industry tries to do, even now, and the food industry. So, you, you know, if you're going to study this area, you've got to be really, really careful about those. And all, whenever you read a study, you've got to be thinking, who funded that? There was one yesterday from, about coffee. Yeah. Coffee is good for you. Seriously, you know, this would, I hope it didn't come from UCL. It was no, in it's period. Period. no, I've been looking at news uh, articles today. I, I'm, I haven't read the actual paper, but I would be very surprised if the authors of the paper and their conclusions were ascribing a cause, positive causal association between coffee and health. Because the chances of being able to adjust statistically in an epidemiological study for all the potential confounders are very, very slim. And there's so many confounders in relation to coffee consumption. But my first, that my first thought when I saw the news item on that was, "Hello, is it being funded by the coffee industry?" <laughs> Probably wasn't, but um, uh, you've always got to watch out. Anyway, I think uh, I now really have overstated my uh, welcome. Thank you very much for for uh, listening, and, and enjoy the rest of your time here. Yeah.